uh, we will have Clifford Ages, the airline pilot flying the plastic fantastic B787 around the world. It's definitely not his first time in Bill Stuff, and uh, his session from last year was one of my favorites. So I encourage you to stay, listen, and we will be back in a minute. Sad I'm not there in uh, Jonas. I'm actually suffering from uh, COVID at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's probably good that I didn't book flights to come out there um, because I wouldn't have been able to make it anyway. But uh, thanks to the team for, uh, for hosting me virtually instead of uh, in person, which is fantastic. Um, as I say, uh, Rose Cup Ages, and my day job is that of flying uh, Boeing 787s around the world um, uh, for a major UK airline. Um, and I'm going to be here today to talk to you about how we on the flight deck make critical decisions when things are not going as they should. Um, how we've been trained to make those decisions and, and how um, you can take those uh, those tools and use them in your day-to-day -day job um, in the software development uh, uh, and uh, DevOps worlds, etc. cetera. Um, so we'll move on. If my slides actually click on. Um, as I say, airline pilot, when I'm not doing that, I'm a freelance .NET uh, developer, mainly in the IoT and uh, Xamarin stroke Maui uh, spaces, so mobile and IoT. Um, they're one in the same really, aren't they? They're both uh, devices with lots of sensors. Um, I love playing electronics and building things. You probably see behind me my workbench um, with uh, all sorts of electronics and toys on. Um, I love teaching people uh, new things, which is why I'm here today, uh, and a bit of cycling and spending time with my family. It's not about me, though. Let's look at my office. So this is the, uh, the Boeing 787-8 uh, uh, aircraft. Um, so there's, there's three versions, a Dash 8, Dash 9, Dash 10. Um, it's not 800, 900, and 1,000, as a lot of people call it. It's Dash 8, Dash 9, Dash 10. Um, as you can see there, I'm a senior first officer, so I sit on the right-hand side. Um, so this is my seat here. <coughs> and uh, we've got a head-up display um, in the, the, uh, the top, which pops down in front of us and gives us a representation of the primary flying display um, in the head-up display. So uh, like fighter pilots, uh, we have this, uh, this uh, screen in front of our face, um, which is absolutely fantastic when it's really poor weather or when um, the wind's blowing really strong across the runway. Um, it gives us so much... Um, um, more cognitive thinking time because you don't need to sit, uh, switch your eyes down inside the flight deck and pop back up again um, and something's changed outside. Um, often asked why there's a cutout in the seat uh, and uh, I'll cover that off now because it's often a question later and I'll go back to all the slides. The cutout in the seat is uh, you think the control column, if you've got short legs um, and you're you're not a very tall person, you need to be able to reach the rudder pedals which are way down in the, uh, in the, um, the footwell there. Um, just like in your car, so you pull the seat forwards. Um, but you need to be able to pull a control column all the way back um, in case you need to do a pull-up go-around, which is where you're putting max power and putting the aircraft onto its tower to miss a mountain um, or a tall building, uh, et cetera. Um, so you need to be able to pull the, the control column all the way back. That's why there's a cutout in the seat. Um, it's also why you, uh, you often see female pilots wear trousers and not uh, dresses and skirts. It's because they need to be able to uh, make sure their clothing doesn't get in the way. So all these little things are uh, thought about um, in aviation. And it all comes from accident data. You know, things have happened in the past where, you know, the control columns hit the seat, et cetera. Um, with 78-8, um, list price is $250 million. I delivered this aircraft, uh, well, about four or five years ago now, uh, from Boeing um, Field in Seattle. Um, and that was, a bit of, that was the price tag that was written on the bit of paper. Um, so obviously you've got to add to that all the seats and, and IFE, the in-flight entertainment, you sit and watch the toilets, the kitchens, um, the carpets, you know, all those other things are added onto that price. That is just bare bones aircraft from uh, from Seattle. View out the office window, though. And uh, I'm, I'm putting these slides at the beginning just to give you a bit of a feel of what it's like to be an airline pilot. Because I know a lot of people here, are, you know, we're all geeks. Uh, that's why we work in the software industry. And, uh, you know, we'll, you know, aviation is a bit of a, of a geek industry as well. Um, on the left-hand side is uh, it's an Elmo's fire. Um, there's a little bit about it. You can read it quicker and I can say it down the bottom there. Um, and that is when you get close to a, a thunderstorm. You can see on their weather radar returns. You can see just here on their navigation display, um, you can see the patches are orange and green and red. Um, that is a, a storm the weather radar of the aircraft picking up. And when you get too close to it, you get this uh, plasma uh, on the windscreen and you get um, the, the kind of looks like lightning growing across the screen. And you think, oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's really pretty. And get your phone out to take a picture. Um, and it's normally a prelude to being struck by lightning. Um, so it's, uh, you see it, it's, oh, we've gotten uh, a little bit too close to the storm. Sometimes you can't avoid it. Sometimes you need to pick a way through a storm cell um, because you need to get to a destination. You can't turn around because there's nothing behind you. You know, think of going somewhere across the Atlantic into, uh, say, Boston or somewhere. Um, you need to pick your way through a storm. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things. The pitch on the right-hand side is the head-up display I mentioned earlier, uh, and, or the HUD. 
And you can see there that uh, we've got our altitudes, 31,000 feet, and uh, our airspeeds, and uh, and you know the autopilot systems at the top. Um, so we were tracking across the Atlantic. Um, if you find any 787 pilot anywhere in the world, um, and you look at their phone, they will all have this picture um, uh, or vari variation of this picture um, because we will take a picture, you know, sunrise over the hub, that sort of thing. Uh, but you can see here we were we were flying back across the Atlantic and catching up with these two aircraft that were in front of us. Uh, most of the night, this was taken about 4 a.m. Um, back across the Atlantic a few years ago. And um, we descended down to 31,000 feet. We're below them. So now they can't descend because we've got that block of airspace below them. So we obviously landed first. Not this a race, um, but first the car park wins. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's the view outside the office window. Anyone that follows me on Twitter, my Twitter handle's on the side of every slide. Um, whenever I'm flying, um, I always post uh, pictures out the flight deck window, um, you know, going across Greenland or northern Russia, flying into Japan and, and things like this. So uh, if you like those sorts of things, please follow me on Twitter. Um, but let's move on. Some interesting facts about the 787. It's uh, quite a power hungry aircraft. Um, it needs 1.45 megawatts of power. That's quite a lot. Um, five times more than adventure airlines. And that's because the air you breathe is uh, is uh, compressed by electric motors and it's not been through the engine so you don't have any issues with um, with uh, engine smells etc because it's all been compressed uh, electrically um, as opposed to engine pressure um, Lockheed Martin uh, Orion spacecraft due to come to space uh, I think it's due soon I think imminently um, the 787 flight deck is uh, is uh, derived from that so uh, hopefully they'll let me have a go um, not sure we'll see uh, the windows you've been on the 787 you'll see the fact they're huge. Um, and they're also dim, um, a bit like a Kindle. They've got kind of an e-ink layer in the middle. Um, so this is all technology that 787s got. Um, it flies at Mach 85, which is 85% the speed of sound at sea level. Um, so give or take a bit around 600, 650 miles an hour when we're up at our cruise level at 43,000 feet. Um, so it, it's a really fast, uh, speedy jet can get around the world quite quickly. Um, and it's got a very clever system called um, uh, turbulence control. Um, and or smooth wave technology and the angle attack range, little veins that stick out the nose of the aircraft that detect the angle um, that the, the aircraft body is uh, pointed at, they can sense turbulence. And then within the milliseconds it takes for the, the wings to reach that patch of airspace, they've sent the process of data and then they've moved the ailerons um, on the wings um, to ride out that, uh, that turbulence. And it all happens in you know, milliseconds. Um, you think we're doing 600 miles an hour, it's probably about, what, 30, 40 foot um, between the nose of the aircraft and the, and the, 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 the cord of the wing, um, the centre of the wing. Um, so this happens. So the technology and computing power of the 787 is really, really impressive. Now, I'm, I'm mentioning these because we want to talk about decision making. That's what we're here to talk about today. So on the 787, um, you know, we uh, start counting how many computers on board. We stopped at 1,000 because we got bored. Um, and it makes the point that it's over a thousand computers um, on the 787, all with code, all making trillions of decisions every single second. Yeah, but it's us, the warm, fleshy pilots that sit at the front um, that make the ultimate decision of what we're going to do. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about, how we're trained as airline pilots and how you can use that in your uh, in your world um, in software development. So hopefully this video uh, is sound. Like Tick, tick the box, so hopefully you'll see this. Now, um, just paint a picture. These guys got up in the morning. Um, they were um, flying off to Tenerife, and uh, they were planning to go down there and probably sit on the beach and have a few beers and relax for a couple of days, then fly home again and go back to their families. Um, so they got up, kissed their wife, their partner, um, goodbye in the morning, you know, ruffled the kid's head and, uh, and tri tripped off to work, um, expecting to go and spend a couple of days on the beach uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the Tenerife. Um, but this is what they got dealt with that day. So... Uh, I'm not sure it's played. It seems to be playing. There we go. So there's Flappy Birds. And that's an engine failure. And I'm sure why the sound is coming out. Um, so that's a, uh, an engine search. Uh, I'm not Adrian, but basically they, they say uh, Mayday, 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 Mayday,
goes down the engine, you get an engine surge, you get like a backfire on a car while they're going through uh, the engine backfire and that's damaged. And uh, you see the flying the aircraft, they're putting the gear up, um, they were done in the emergency front. Mayday, 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 Thompson 253, no stop, engine failure, we are continuing with North West Fleet and then inbound towards Wallace. Three huge guns fly the aircraft. Thompson 263, Hotel Roger, all runways available for landing, surface wind zero, surface two degrees of fire. And they will fly out. They went off through Wallasey and they sat there, dumped a bit of fuel and then come back and landed about 25, 30 minutes later. Um, but that's not what they were thinking they were going to deal with when they got up that morning, had the cornflakes and, and left, you know, skipping off to work to go to the beach. Um, how about these instances then? Who remembers these? Who remembers on the 15th of January 2009? Seems an age ago now, but, um, you know, four minutes from uh, departure, multiple bird strikes out of climbing um, uh, out of uh, LaGuardia. And then they, uh, they end up putting it on the Hudson. And they've even made a, a feature-length film about it, um, the Miracle on the Hudson. So, you know, again, not what those expecting to have when they got up in the morning. Um, Captain Pete Burkill uh, and the uh, 038 incident that landed uh, into Heathrow. And they had about 30 seconds, just under 30 seconds to land in when they had their, their emergency. They've been flying for 13 and a half hours back from Bangkok. Um, so, you know, they, it's like literally they, they could see the car park where the car was parked and their, their route home to their family. And they have a major emergency and crash land aircraft um, on the grass. Um, you know, the, the crew did an amazing job in making sure they made the, the, uh, the airfield. Um, they didn't quite make the runway, but they made the airfield. Anyone that knows this area of Heathrow is um, just below the uh, ILS antenna, which is at the bottom here. Um, there is a, uh, a London Underground Station and a BP petrol garage. Now imagine if they had landed 100 metres earlier, um, what carnage that would have caused. Um, if, and that's where the trajectory of the aircraft was taking them. But uh, Captain Pete, Bur Pete Burkill moved the flat lever, uh, which is something we do in a go around. Um, and he took a conscious decision. He took a few seconds to make a conscious decision that if I move this, it would just uh, the uh, drag on the aircraft and we'll, we'll make the airfield. Um, he knew they weren't going to make the runway, but he knew they'd make the airfield and missed Hatton Cross at the BP Petro Garage. He saved a lot of lives that day, just that one decision. But how do we make the decisions? We've all heard of uh, the caveman fight or flight response. Um, we all know what that is. You hear a, a, a loud bang and uh, you jump and uh, or you run or you scream. It depends who you are. Um, that is a, a, a an input into the body. Yeah. And there's a fantastic book. Um, uh, and I've forgotten the name now. And it's going to really annoy me. Um, I'll put it in the in the chat afterwards. Um, but uh, the chimp paradox, that's it, by Professor Steve Peters. Um, and my sort of COVID brain's slowly catching up. Um, so uh, that book at the beginning, third, talks about this uh, chimp paradox where um, the fight or flight is like our chimp response from, you know, back in the day when we, we were chimps. Um, so the input comes in, the chimp is really quick and, and just processes it and does something. Um, so if you think you pick up a hot, hot, hot frying pan, the handle's been over the gas burner and it's hot, You'll drop it, won't you? You hear a car backfire on the street and you duck and, and get out of the way um, and that sort of thing. And then there's the human response. It's a little bit slower because humans, we're lazy. Um, we take a few minutes to uh, to wake up. It's like, what happened? What was that? Um, so then the human starts to process the inputs. Um, you can train your chimp, though, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, as we go through this talk. Um, uh, so Bradley Wiggins, a uh, great comment from him as well about uh, caging the chimp. We often talk about it. We um, practice in the simulator. My check is in a few weeks' time. Every six months, we go into the simulator um, and uh, we hand our license across um, to the training department and they take us through two days of checking, training and examining. And at the end of it, hopefully they're signing the box and they give us a license back and go back flying passengers. Uh, I've been doing it for 20 years now. And if, uh, if they don't sign in that box, that's, that's me. That's my career. Um, I'll get training, et cetera, input to try and get me back up, up to uh, up to the required standard. Um, but yeah, every six months I'm, I'm checked and, and tested. Um, you know, it's the most tested industry in the world um, is aviation. You know, once a year I go and see the doctor to make sure I'm fit and well. At the moment, I don't have a license because my medicals, because I have COVID at the moment, my medical has been uh, revoked. Um, so I need to hopefully get that back in a few weeks time when I'm all better. Um, but a chip comes in first and then the human response. Um, we take this a stage further. Um, we have uh, the cognitive thinking time. So the chimp is, if you don't have a lot of time, that is your caveman-esque response. You can train your chimp. Uh, and that's really important. We practice in the simulator engine failures, just like you see with that Thompson aircraft uh, earlier in the video. Um, they would have practiced that hundreds of times. I've practiced it hundreds of times in my 20-year career. Um, so if it happens now, if I was to go flying you know, in a week or two's time and I have an engine failure climbing out of London Heathrow, 
Um, I wouldn't even think about it. I would just do the drills um, because I know how to do it. I can do it blindfolded with my arm tied behind my back um, and I can just get on with it. That is training your chin, yeah, to, to not jump and be scared. And we quite often say about feeding it a banana. So if you want to calm yourself down, you know, close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, three big deep breaths. Um, if you have time, obviously, sometimes you don't, we tend not to. So I'll tend to close my eyes, take a really big deep breath and say, right, what is it I'm dealing with? And that's enough time for the human to wake up and jump in and say, whoa, hold on, Jim, let's do something different here. Um, in between the two, as a checklist. Now, a checklist is what we train to use. So an engine failure, we have an engine failure checklist, and that's what we would use um, to um, make sure that we don't need the human to, to come in and analyze the problem and be all analytical. Um, we don't want the chimp to be getting all up to and just say to the chimp, don't worry, there's a checklist for this, and we'll just follow the checklist. Um, our checklist, our quick reference handbooks, QRH, is a good inch and a half thick. And uh, it's got every, every checklist in there um, that could possibly go wrong with a 787. And um, they, we have it electronically on the um, uh, on the systems in front of us as well, the screens in front of us. But the paper checklist is just a backup in case the computers fail because that could happen. So, um, so naturalistic is what the, the chimp is. Um, analytical is what human, and then the raw base or heuristic, which is a shortcut, um, is the uh, the middle one. So some of my daily decisions. If you look at these, being struck by lightning, I've been struck by lightning um, probably six or seven times now. Um, not because I'm irresponsible. It's just you have no control of when you know Mother Nature is going to reach out and uh, and uh, and strike you with a bolt of lightning. Um, never had anything wrong with the aircraft. We land. We have to fill in loads of paperwork. The engineers then pour up the aircraft and find the burn marks where the uh, lightning bolt has gone in and exited the aircraft. Normally goes in at the front, and exits at the back. Um, so the aircraft's grounded for you know maybe even a couple of days while they, they find and repair those, uh, those burn marks. Um, surge top climb. So we've got the top climb. That uh, Thompson aircraft you, you see earlier had an engine surge where it bangs. We've got top climb. Just had my breakfast, put a fork full of uh, sausage in my uh, mouth because it, uh, it was off to Zurich. It was dead early in the morning. And uh, bang, and the aircraft starts swinging all over the sky. And uh, so I put breakfast down. Um, I was a little bit annoyed at the time because, well, I wanted to eat my breakfast. Um, so uh, emergency, just pushing back off stand. We had a cabin crew call us up in the back and they never talk to us once we start moving because that is the drill, unless there's an emergency. So instantly we knew there's an emergency and there's something going on in the back. Um, normally it's passengers standing up, that sort of thing. And they're telling us we're just going to sit them down. Um, so we'd stop and wait for them to sit the passengers down. Um, and normally it works because the rest of the passengers get upset and tell them to sit down and, and lots of screaming and shouting happens. Um, airport closed due to snow, flying across the Atlantic um, towards Newark. And uh, the snow was meant to arrive about two hours after we arrived into Newark. Um, that was just the, the plan. Um, but we uh, we got caught out. We got there early. Um, the stronger winds made the snow in early and the airport was snow closed. Um, so, yeah, it was it was an interesting night uh, in the office of working out where we can and can't go, how much fuel we have. You know, could we make it to that airport? No, because then I'm not taking any more aircraft because they're full, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you don't plan these things, but they, they, they reach out and grab you. So how do we go through um, <coughs> using a, a model? Uh, in aviation, just like in software, there's lots of acronyms. And uh, the one we use is TDODA. Um, so um, this is the, the model we use. If you take the T off, the DODA section um, comes from uh, the NASA and Apollo. Um, just we see in build stuff, they're very much into the, uh, um, I think this is Mercury room, isn't it? So they're very much into the space theme. Um, so um, DODAR comes from uh, the Apollo era of uh, how they were going to get things back. They would really use this or a form of this um, uh, model uh, when they're doing, you know, Apollo 13, et cetera. Um, but we added as an airline, we added T to the end. And um, I'll take you through and explain what these are. Um, so T is for time. How much time do we have? D is diagnosis. O is for options. D is for decision. A is to assign and R is to review. Now it looks really, really simple. It's actually, you know, and it is very simple, but there's it's some complex bits in there around team skills as well. And I've seen this when I've gone in and worked with, as a freelance developer, I've gone in and worked with teams in, in companies and you see that they make a decision and it seems to be that the head honcho, the, the team lead, the manager makes the decision, everyone else has to blindly follow. Um, and it just doesn't work. Um, so I'll take you through this and you'll notice the fact the team lead doesn't come in much, much later. So time isn't the emergency. Do we have a rule? Um, do we have a checklist that we can follow? Is it a, an engine failure after departure? Yes, we have a checklist for that. And we'll go through and do the checks. So there's even a memory drill for that. So you don't even have time to get the paper checklist out and look at the screen. Um, you just do it by a touch. Um, and that. 
Um, can we make more time? You know, okay, well, the, the server's gone down and, uh, you know, we're, we're now offline, um, but it's two o'clock in the morning. So really, we're not really going to have many customers on our site. So, you know what, let's just take five minutes and just think about what's happened. Or is it, you know, 10, 10 a.m. and it's Black Friday and, the, you know, the server's gone down and you're losing millions of pounds a second. Um, that is the, the difference, you know, so just take a second, a moment to think about how much time do we have and how much time can we make um, we often in aviation talk about do we have time for a cup of tea? Um, you know, being British, we love our cups of tea. Um, and if we do, then we'll take that five minutes to, to ding the cabin crew and so we can get two teas or coffees. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk through the problem before we dive into a formal tea dodo. And that could be something like a medical emergency where it's not, you know, critical to make a decision to turn right and get the aircraft on the, on the ground as quickly as possible because, um, because the cabin crew are medically trained and they're dealing with the situation. Um, you know, so that is the kind of time where we might think about um, not uh, making Im immediate decisions. Um, the important bit, though, is start stop wash. So if you're having a, uh, a really bad day at work and you plan to use this TDO model, make sure you make note of time, start stop watch. If you're in a meeting room, there's a whiteboard on the wall right down the time you started. Um, and just think about the fact that, okay, we've been working at this for 10 minutes now and, and we've not moved any further forward. Um, there was a uh, um, uh, black box thinking uh, by Syed, and I can't remember his surname, uh, but if you look at black box thinking on Amazon or wherever your favourite bookseller is, um, there's uh, an incident where a, um, a lady went in for a, uh, a medical treatment into an operating theatre, standard medical treatment, and she even just said to her husband, here's a shopping list and come and get me in a couple of hours, I'll see you soon, honey, bye. And off he went to the shops to do shopping while his wife went to have this uh, medical procedure. But she had an allergic reaction to the uh, anaesthetic. Um, and because of that, um, she uh, her throat constricted. She couldn't breathe. Um, so the uh, the surgeon, the junior surgeon, tried to get an airway in where they put the, the, the tube down the throat. Couldn't do it. Um, so uh, the, the the senior um, training doctor was in the room. He bars him out. Look, I'll show you how to do it, son. And tried to get one in there. Still couldn't do it. Um, you know, and then a, uh, the senior registrar on duty come rushing into the theatre and tried to help and, you know, tried to get air in. Still couldn't do it. 11 minutes elapsed um, with her not having air. Um, so obviously, um, sadly, she passed away. Um, but the whole time, there was a junior nurse standing there with an emergency tracheotomy kit, which is where they put a slice uh, in your trachea there and put a tube in there. Um, and she kind of stepped forward, a bit meek and shy because she was very, very junior. And the doctor wearing his white coat and, you know, I'm a doctor. Um, you know, she didn't want to speak up. And that's because of the authority grading. But if they'd known, if she had said, look, it's been four minutes now and you still haven't got an airway, do you want this? That might have been enough to break them away and think about the time they've been doing it. So if we move on. Um, T also stands for team. Um, it's a team exercise. Um, they would be in a team, the doctors, but they discounted the nurse. They discounted the uh, anesthesiologists and the, the other uh, medics who were in the room. So think of it as a team, especially if you're a team leader. Um, you know, make sure you come across as being a member of the team, not the team leader. Um, it's really, really important. Uh, on the flight deck, um, I'm a senior first officer. I have a captain sitting to my left. Um, we have the cabin crew as well, the ground staff, air track control, but we work as one big team. Um, and if the captain's making a decision which I think is wrong, I'll tell him. I'll say, I, you know, I don't think that's right, and this is my reasoning. And that's the opportunity for them to come back. Actually, Cliff, um, great uh, great insight there. But the reason I'm picking this is because X, Y, Z. Because they've got, I don't know, something they know that I don't know, um, or they've seen something I've not seen. Um, and then it's a discussion item. It's not, I'm the captain, we're doing what I say. It's never that. Um, certainly not in aviation in the last 15 or 20 years. It's never that anymore. So, um, so that's time. Move on to diagnosis. What we're doing here is diagnosing the problem. What are we trying to fix? Not how we're going to fix it, not um, who did what and, and start the blame game. What are we trying to fix? Okay, the server's gone down. Um, it's Black Friday. And, um, you know, we just didn't think we'd get that many people hitting our site and it's just crashed. Um, okay, so we're just trying to fix the server. Um, ask open questions. The open question is a question that cannot elicit a one word answer. Yes, no, maybe. It needs to be a question where it elicits an answer where it stops a person because they have to form a sentence, a long sentence. So it stops them and makes them think about the problem. So um, the first thing that often goes when you're in a stressful situation is you're hearing. So if you see someone is uh, can't hear you, and you're like, you know, Bob, Bob, come on, Bob, um, Bob, have you seen this? And they're not replying to you because they're really, really stressed and their hearing's gone. Yeah. So quite often um, you need to shout, um, shout a name, um, even to give them a light nudge. 
um, just to snap them out of it and get them back out of it. And then ask them an open question um, straight away to, to kind of get them to kind of, hold on, what's going on around me? Um, and that's really, really important. We practice it in the sim, but it's always a bit role-playing because obviously we're, we're professionals, we've been doing it for many years, but we still practice it. Um, tell me why it's not this. You know, Tell me why it's not the fact that the, the DNS has gone wrong again. Um, because it's always the DNS, let's be honest. Um, uh, or it's not the left engine. Why do you think it's the right engine, not the left engine? Um, and that, again, gets someone to stop and think. And then agree as a team, really important, as a team, agree what you're trying to fix. Agree what the problem is. Yeah, if you're in a meeting room, write on the whiteboard. Um, we often note it down on a bit of paper in the flight deck. We're trying to fix a, um, a electrical, major electrical failure um, of the, of the uh, bus, uh, bus A, uh, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll jot it down. That's what we're trying to, trying to uh, solve and we'll have the time. All that goes on to a safety report later, but it's not about the report, it's about writing it down. So we all know as a team what we're doing. And really important, the clock's ticking because you did start the clock, didn't you? So you need to think about that as well. Oh, options, what should we do? This is the bit that you all know and love. You've done it before, you're brainstorming, you're in the room, you're writing up on the whiteboard, all these ideas, etc. Um if you're the person at the whiteboard, doesn't necessarily need to be a team leader, leader. And I often see it's working better when it's not a team leader that stands at the whiteboard. Reason being is people are scared to say to their team, uh, to management, the team leader, that, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's this um, because they don't want to see, seem to be silly. Um, it actually works best if actually the team leader gets out of the room. Um, obviously, we can't do that in the flight deck, but um, you, you get the gist of what I'm saying. Um Take input from all members. If you've got a quiet person that's, that's an intern or has only just started, they sit in the back of the room. They probably have a fantastic idea because they don't have your, um, your uh, years of experience on the project and you know it inside out, but they may see something that you haven't because they're looking at it from, with fresh eyes and uh, um, from a different perspective to you. Um, so ask them, you know, what do you think um, you know, we should do here? Um, it gets them involved. It gets them to start talking. And and, uh, and then you can then move on with those ideas. No such I, uh, no such thing as a silly idea. Your silly idea that you think is stupid, yeah, um, verbalise it anyway. Um, and if you hear someone say something silly and it's like, don't chastise them. Don't, oh, that's stupid. Don't, you know, don't do that, Bob. It's, uh, um, you know, it's like, well, that's not going to work. But yeah, yeah, we'll stick it out on the board. And that that kind of moment where that silly idea is, is put up or put out there could jog someone else's memory and they come up with a fantastic idea based on what you said. Um, so get someone thinking, it's like, well, why would that be, that's stupid, but hold on, he's on something there. Because your silly idea is your brain's way of saying to you, I've got this kind of idea and I'm not sure and you, you can't quite think it through. Just put it to the team, get the team to help you, um, you know, uh, come up. Don't drag it out again, the clock's running. Uh, often the first, the, the best idea is, is one of the first two or three um, often it's the first, um, certainly if you've seen it before and you've trained and you've got a checklist, um, decide. So uh, this is where we make a decision. And as a team, you decide, not team lead, not management, not the, the, the head of sales or anything like that. As a team that's dealing with the problem, yeah, it's you that decide and you all agree together. You know, show of hands, however you decide to do it, um, you decide as a team. Reason for that is if the team lead manager decides, well, we're doing this and we're going to fix this over here. Um, and you just go off and tell everyone this is what we're doing, you'll lose your team. They won't be with you. Um, whereas if the team agrees to do, right, actually, we're going to fix this, we're going to drop the server, we'll stand up another uh, Docker container, wherever it is you're going to do, um, you will um, bring the team with you. And they'll have some skin in the game. They'll have some, they'll invest it into, into solving this problem because it's their decision as well as yours. Um, so make sure you bring the team with you. So, you know, show hands tend to work best or, you know, uh, uh, kind of who's, you know, are you all agreed that we're going to do this? Um, but, you know, don't let the team lead or manager make that decision. Um, don't spend too much time uh, uh, deciding, uh, pick an option and go with it. Even if it's something that's bad, you'll get more input, more feedback. So this is a bad idea and uh, we need to uh, need to step back. Uh, we're all human, we're fallible. We'll step back. Let's look at this again and, and go down a different path. Um, even if you decide to take no action, it needs to be a, a, a cognitive decision. You need to stop, think, and say, right, at the moment, we don't have enough information. We are not going to take any action. Yeah, and you declare that as a team. We can't take any action just yet because we're just waiting to find out this person at the back of the aircraft is having a heart attack or they've just got a bit of indigestion. Um, so, you know, and just give it. But state the fact we're not making any decision. We're going to review this in two minutes time. We're going to review this in five minutes time, not 
tomorrow or next week, review it quickly uh, and, uh, and come back to the decision. Uh, and it's state decision, write in big words on the board, circle it, do whatever you're going to do, um, state decision. So we will state it on the flight deck. We're dealing with left engine failure. We're going to carry out left engine um, checklists um, and we'll go through that and we'll state it loud and proud um, as to what we're doing. And then we'll carry on the, uh, the drills that we need to do. The really important bit though is failure to decide, is decide to fail. If you spend so much time here, try, can't pick whether it's, you know, uh, route A, B or C that you've got up on the board and you don't know and you're faffing around, the clock will run out uh, and then that's it. You know, it'll be the end of end of Black Friday and the sales are down all day and you've made no sales and you know full well that management are coming down on you um, because you've lost millions. Um, so just make a decision, you know, uh, what you need to do, go with it. If it's the wrong decision, you'll get input, which uh, then comes back and helps you uh, fix that decision. A, it's a sign. So we assign this, um, and this is uh, where the team leader steps in. And the team leader does it because they should, hopefully, if they're a good team lead, um, know the strengths and weaknesses of the team members. So it's the first time, really, the team leader should be involved in their, I've got a team leader and I've got the team leader hat on. Um, so uh, this is the first time they, 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 they get involved. And they will then make uh, assign the task. Uh, right, I want Bob, you do this. Jill, when you do that. Jane, when you do this. Um, make the tasks, if you're a team lead, make the tasks short and sweet. Um, don't make them very long uh, because you want them to come back really quickly. Don't give them a task going to take a week. Give them a task going to take a few hours at most, uh, minutes if you can do it. Um, and then they can come back um, because that way you get all the feedback back in. Of I did this, but it's not worked. You know, I dropped the database and, and stood it back up. I, you know, I uh, instantiated uh, a new cluster, um, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever it is you've done. Um, or you've asked your team to go off and do it, you want to just come back and say, I tried it, it didn't work. Okay, well, we need to think of something else. Um, if you give them a task that takes days, it could be days before you get any feedback. So give them a short, sweet um, task. It's not a race. Um, if you rush off to your desk and uh, get your task done, don't do it. Think, right, I'm done, and I'm just going to sit back and relax. I'm going to go on the internet and, and surf that new thing I want to buy um, for Christmas. Um, complete task go back so I, I've, I've done that and this is the outcome and what else you need me to do help your colleagues um you know they might be stressed go and check on them make sure that they're not uh, they're not so stressed out that their hearing's gone um and they start getting blinkered and tunnel vision um you know go and chat to them make sure they're okay make them a cup of coffee that sort of thing um you know and you know if you're a team lead and you start seeing emails from your team at two o'clock in the morning um you know for a while they're stressed because they shouldn't really be up at two in the morning I know as software devs, we like to sometimes start late and work on things, but you know, just think about their uh, their, their their workload and how much you give them. Um, consider overloads. If you can't complete it, put your hand up. I'm I'm lost. It. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I thought I knew how to do this. I don't. Um, you know, it's not a time to be proud. You your team will appreciate you more if you put your hand up and say, "I don't know. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Please help." Um, if you bumble along and the clock runs out and you didn't do it, it's like, why didn't you do it? It's like, oh, I didn't really know. And, um, 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 they're going to hate you and you're never going to live it down. Um, so just, I don't know. Can I get something else to do or can someone come and give me a hand here um, to make sure? The last one is um, is art, which is review. And this is the bit everyone forgets. They get to the end, we sign the task, everyone's gone off and done their thing. Then everyone's like, brilliant, it's working. The server's back up and yep, yeah, okay, we're getting sales again. Brilliant, perfect, right. Let's go to the pub or let's go and get lunch. Um, let's get to review. Um, the review bit yeah, is where you look at, have we fixed the problem? You might have stood the server back up just by you know rebuilding it all and standing it all back up again. Um, but if you haven't reviewed it, what took it down in the start? You know, Why did it crash? Was it the fact that it's Black Friday and you had too many people in it? Or was it two o'clock in the morning on, on, a, on a Tuesday morning and you know nowhere near Black Friday or anything else? And well, why did it go down? Um, we still have time. We assigned ourselves an hour. We've still got 15 minutes left. Um, so let's let's look at it and see if we can work out why it fell over. Um, repeat the T-Dodar. Did we diagnose the, the problem correctly? Or did we just fix it by, you know, reinstantiating and, and standing everything else back up again? Um, you know, um, was there something else, like it, it's another problem somewhere else that will take it down again in a couple of days' time? Unless you review, you won't know that. Um, did we make the correct decision? Is it still the best decision or is there more input that's come in that we can make a change and think about uh, um, a different a, a, a different um, a decision we can do? And the really, really, really important bit about review is the fact that's your opportunity. Once you, you're 100% certain you fixed it and you're sorted, yeah, write down who did what and how they did it. That is where you make your checklist. 
that is where you make your your um, your um, QRH, your Quick Reference Handbook. And you can. Have, I've worked in a couple of companies, and uh, they've started building their Quick Reference Handbook. And the idea is is the fact that when you leave the company you work at, you're not dropping your colleagues because you're the one that knows how to do the Kubernetes stuff, or you're the one that knows how to do the, the database stuff, or whatever it is that you on the team are the expert at. You're leaving your colleagues with, uh, this is how you fix it when this goes wrong. When you see this happen, this is how you do it. Write it down in big letters, bold. You know, if you see this, do this, this, and this, and make a list. And that's your checklist that you leave behind with your colleagues, your friends. Um, you know, um, it's the way that you can help uh, make sure. And then when the new team the new team member comes in, if they see the problem, they go to QRH, it's like, well, this hasn't been seen before. And it helps you when you, um, you're you diagnosed the problem. We've seen this before. Let's look in the checklist and see if there's a list for it. And it helps you get through the TDR model really, really quickly. Don't be scared to change your mind. Um, we're human, we're fallible, uh, we'll make mistakes. Um, you know, I make lots of, uh, ask my wife, I make lots of them every day. Um, so, uh, don't be scared. Put your hand up. Yeah, we're, we've done this wrong. Uh, let's go back. Um, you'll get input when you make a decision and you start working down a path. You'll get input from um, the sales and marketing teams. You'll get input from the, 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 the project managers, um, you know, the business, your clients, your customers. You'll get input from lots of different places. Um, so, But don't be scared. They'll appreciate you more. I worked on a project many years ago where um, we put together a design. We went into a client and they hated it. It was not even close to what they wanted. Um, so we literally, we, we sat them and uh, we asked if we could borrow a meeting room and we worked through the night and uh, and got it sorted. And this was, you know, a massive project, multi-million pound project uh, when I was in engineering and car industry. Um, and we worked, you know, till early hours in the morning, um, rehashing it and redesigning it. And we met them for breakfast. They weren't expecting us to be there still, but we met them. We, we got some breakfast in. We sat and said, look, we took on board your rent. We, we made a mistake. We didn't think about you. We were thinking about what's best for us as a company. Here, is this what you want? And we won the project because they see the fact that actually um, we wasn't scared to change our mind. We wasn't scared to listen um, and, and make a decision to actually sort the problem out. So TDODAR, time, diagnosis, options, decisions, assign, review. Um, hopefully it works for you. Um, normally, if I'm doing this in person, we'll go off in little teams and, and practice. Um, I'm aware of the fact that I've only got four minutes left, so obviously we can't do that. Um, but review, if I've not said it once, twice or ten times, Make sure you always review. It's really important you do that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure why this is flashing. Uh, place flight review is, uh, we always do this every flight. We land the aircraft. We always do a place flight review. Um, I need to fix why that's flashing. I apologize for that. Um, and the reason we do a place flight review, even if we landed and it's a gloriously clear day and nothing happened, nothing out of the ordinary, we still do a place flight review. It's part of our shutdown checks of the aircraft. It's where we talk about what happened and why. Who did what? Uh, who made a great decision? Who made a poor decision? Um, what did we like about it? And we'd like to repeat next time. What didn't we like about it? And actually, you know what? Next time, you know, when air track control tell us we can we can take an early descent, I, I'm not going to take that because we burnt a bit of extra fuel. We didn't really need to. Um, so this is your review. This is where you start to build up your, your knowledge base and write out your checklist. Um, were the SOP standard operating procedures followed? Or should we have done something different? Um, and do we need to take further action? Do we need to train, call up the uh, training management team and say, "Look, we've seen this. We made a mistake, and uh, it was a you know it was a it was a bad day at the office." Um, we feed that back to the training team and our management. Um, and the idea is that they will learn from mistakes. Um, don't keep it quiet. Share those mistakes. We have a magazine that we call the Horror Mag. It's published every month, and it has everyone that's fed back there. Uh, the instances um, that they've seen on the line, um, you know, things that happened um, get put into this magazine every month that is shared with us. Um, and we then all learn from that. It's like, so if I see that, I know for a well that I'm training my chimp because I know for a well that actually they fixed that problem by doing this or they had that problem because they did that. Um, I would then know not to, to make the same mistake as they did. So post-flight review or post-project um, review is really, really important. A great time to go to the bar and have a few beers and, and talk about it. Um, it's what we tend to do when we get off the, off the flight deck. We'll go and sit in the bar, and if we've had something uh, we didn't like, we'll go and sit in the bar and have a few beers. Best time to have a beer because you're furthest away from flying a plane again. Um, so, yeah, um, that's what we do. And then um, this is where I'd normally go in and do a, a challenge, and we'd go through and, and practice using the T-Loader model. But I've got two minutes left. So I think really, um, if we go to a QA, and a because it's a bit difficult to do this when it's remote, because you kind of need to go off in little teams, um, it's not really going to work. Um, but if we go to uh, a Q&A session uh, for the last couple of minutes and see if uh, there's any uh, questions, 
um, or if you want to go up and grab a coffee, but that's my tool. If I go through to, um, to the end, um, and there's a little bit there um, about bringing it close at home, I'll let you read those as well. Um, so is there any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Hi, Clifford. Uh, yeah, well, nice to meet you again. We have a few questions online and maybe in the audience. If somebody in the audience has a question at any time, please raise your hand. I will come to you. And from the online, we have a question from Danny. Is there a minimum and maximum team size to practice TDO DAR? Um, no. Uh, if you think about it on the flight deck, uh, there's normally two of us, sometimes three or four pilots, but there's normally two of us. When we do our uh, sim check, mine's at the beginning of December, um, so a few weeks away, um, I'll go hand my career over again. Um, there'll just be two of us because the trainer um, won't take part because um, obviously a test and examine us. Um, but yeah, I've done this in teams. I did it with a team at Microsoft um, uh, recently, um, last month, and uh, they had 60 people in the team. And then we did we uh, we did the first bit. They, they, we said, right, we've got an hour to solve this problem. Um, and we broke them up into smaller groups and we, we sent them off with, right, you're going to sort that problem, you're going to sort that problem. And we sent them off. Obviously, if you've got a massive team, it's not going to work, so try and keep it small. Um, when I've worked in software teams uh, uh, as a freelance developer um, and I bring this in as a model to solve a problem, um, I find kind of groups around a size of 10 to 15 is, is best um, and because otherwise you get too many, too many people talking. Um, yeah, that's the, the best way. Make sure you've not got loads of um, loads of chiefs and not enough Indians. Um, as in, you've, you've not got everyone in the meeting room is is the, the team lead, the manager, and higher up. Um, bring in those that are, are, are you know working the front line, are, you know crashing out the code or doing whatever they're doing, and because they know, because they do it day in day out, they know the uh, the system probably better than you do as a team lead um, because they do it. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, but yeah, kind of 10 to 15 works best. Uh, bigger than that, you kind of have to break them up into smaller groups. We have another question, uh, quite a few actually. Uh, a question about a specific slide that you showed. Why is it exactly uh, where the lead comes in, not earlier, but exactly then? You know, the team leader, there was a slide mentioning that only then. It comes in then. What we find, um, certainly in aviation, I've done this when I've done it with, with the software teams and, uh, and teams in the medical profession as well, when I've, I've gone in and helped them. Um, if the team lead comes in too early, um, then what happens is you get this authority grade. The last line on this slide here, actually, where everyone looks at the team lead or the manager uh, and, and the head of the department and says, well, you're the boss, you know what to do. Um, and they don't put any input in. Um, so the best thing to do is until you assign the tasks, it should be a team, the whole team, no one else. It's, the, you know, no one's like, I'm the team lead, we're doing this. Um, they can facilitate, um, but it's, I often find actually, if you get a junior person to facilitate, actually you get more from it because everyone is uh, open and honest then. Um, if you're a team lead, if you're a manager, um, you know, um, quite often I'll fly with a captain um, uh, and uh, uh, on the briefing, on the bus out to the aircraft, they'll say, look, Cliff, I'm a human like you, I'm fallible like you, you think I'm doing it wrong, tell me. And that's them saying to me and give you, empowering me to speak up. Um, they don't need to, I, I know most of them, um, you know, uh, on the fleet, um, but they will say it anyway because they're empowering me. They'll say it to the cabin crew as well, look, I may be the captain of the aircraft, um, but if you see something, tell me, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a pilot, I'm just a person like you. Um, I can make mistakes. So you're empowering your team, your staff to talk up. Um, so if you do that, you won't have this authority gradient. Um, if you look at um, uh, an incident from uh, years and years ago, there was a, a Lufthansa flight that crashed in Tenerife, uh, was taken off in fog and hit another aircraft on the runway. Over 600 people lost their lives. The first officer and the flight engineer on the flight knew there was another aircraft on the, on the, uh, on the runway, but was scared to speak up. When I mentioned that nurse that stood there with the emergency tracheotomy kit, um, she knew what needs to be done, but was scared to speak up. So if you're a team lead, a manager, make sure you empower your staff to speak up. You'll thank them for it later, trust me. Um, but just give them that power. Just say, look, I'm human like you. You know, I may have been doing it a bit longer than you or I have a bit more experience, but I make mistakes. I'm human, I'm fallible. Um, so empower them um, and trust me, it will work. Okay, thank you. Uh, John is actually pretty much begging in the chat, please can Sir Clifford share the slides with us? 
Uh, yes, I can share the slides. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how you want the slides shared, um, but I'm quite happy to share these slides. Um, I've, you'll, you'll find I've given this talk many times. It'll be, um, I think it's even been recorded, isn't it? But if you, um, if someone that builds stuff wants to let me know, I can quite happily share these slides. I think I can make it happen. I will let the yeah. right people know. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, saying, just curious, what programming language can be used? Um, any, it's not about program language, is it? It's about how you make a decision. It's about how you, uh, how you, as a team, decide what to fix, what needs fixing, how you go to fix it. Um, the, the, the programming language, the, the tools you use is, is just your, your tools, um, and nothing more. Um, but it's the people, the team, um, the soft squishy things that set the end of the, the point end of, a, of an aircraft. Um, it's them that make decisions. Your tools will help you. Um, you know, your program language, your, your visual studio, your rider, whatever it is you're using, um, you know, as your portal, and that will help you, you know, solve the problem uh, as a tool. Um, but it's not going to, just like I said earlier, the 787 has thousands of computers making trillions of decisions, but it's us that make the ultimate decision. So all those tools are just going to help you um, in, in solving the problem, coming up with options and coming up with your decision of what to do. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, don't think that the tools can save you. The team is what's going to save you. Okay, we still have a couple of questions online, but let me ask the audience, do we have any questions by the moment? No, not really, everyone is shy. Okay, let's go back online. <laughs> uh, get used to it, it's usual. I have to kick them yeah. to ask questions <laughs> in the live, you know. Uh, okay, Doreen is asking, how different is TDODAR from Scrum? Um, it's... Yeah, I mean, Scrum's a, a, a methodology that we use to kind of manage a project. TDODA is used to manage when it goes wrong. Scrum's not going to help you when things go wrong. It's going to kind of help you kind of bumble along through the problem. Whereas TDODA is, is to actually, you know, the fan has been hit by a big pile of stuff. Um, it's not very good. Uh, we need to fix it. We need to fix it now. Um, TDODA is to get you through a crisis. Um, and, and solve the problem. We use it on the flight deck because if something was to go wrong, I use it at home when I'm, you know, I, I'm doing something. You know, I should have hoovered the house and my wife's gone to the shop, so I've got 15 minutes left, but I really want to watch the end of the, the Formula One race. You know, my options are to get told off by my wife and watch the end of the race. You know, that it's a methodology of solving a time critical problem uh, and, and time critical decision making skills. Um, it's not a way to lead and manage a team um, because, you know, it's, it's just not designed for that. That's where you'd use your scrum and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a way of uh, managing a crisis. Um, or if a team make, needs to make a decision and you're not sure whether you're going to go with, you know, um, Java or C Sharp on this project and you really don't know, you can go in a meeting, set the clock, so we've got an hour to make the decision, yeah, and force a decision out of the hour. Um, it's a way of making those decisions um, uh, and, and pulling something out of the bag um, in a, a short space of time. Um, I've gone in and, and done it with startups where we've gone in and they've just not been sure what they're going to do. We've run through the TDODA model as a trained exercise like I've done with you today. And then I've hung around as a facilitator to help them facilitate the problem. Um, and it works really, really well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a way of deciding what to do in a crisis. Hey, uh, thank you. And Fabian has a reminder for you for some reason. He says, Cliff, please remember about putting the book title. Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, I, I, I should. Thank you, Fabian. And uh, the, 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 the reason is, is um, on my notes, I normally have the book titles and the books I mentioned. Um, so uh, Professor Steve Peters and the Chimp Paradox is one of them. And uh, Black Box Thinking by Said, and I still can't remember his surname. And I should put that on my slides. I, I totally agree. And uh, thank you for that feedback. Um, I'm always open to feedback. I will stick it on my slides. And, uh, and then when I publish the slides, they'll be on the slides as well. Um, but yes, thank you for that. It's, uh, it is a great idea and I keep meaning to do it and I'm going to make sure I do it today. Um, if you have any other questions after this, my, uh, my Twitter handle is on the side of the slide there. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, if you want help with a project, again, feel free to reach out. I'm quite happy to help you through these uh, quick decisions you may have in the business. Okay, uh, thank you, Clifford. Uh, do we have any last minute questions from the audience? If not, we are going for a slight coffee pause. You know, we have snacks outside. You're really, yes. you, you should be really sad you're not here live, okay? We have a huge venue and a lot of things going on. 
Okay, yeah, so uh, bring bring a round of applause for Clifford. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next year too. <laughs>